Hey, I'm Nathan Tabor with Handling Life. Thanks for joining us today. I've got a really special guest uh, today. I've known uh, Ryan Dobson for probably 15, 16, 17 years through uh, various political events and uh, religious conservative events. Uh, he's now the president of Rebel Parenting, and he's based out of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, and reading about what Rebel Parenting uh, does, I'm really excited to have Ryan join us today. And Ryan, thanks so much for uh, coming on and being part of the Handling Life podcast. Oh, thanks, Nathan. It's a total pleasure to be here. I'm super excited. So what made you start Rebel Parenting? Uh, honestly, I saw a need that just wasn't being met. Um, I was doing traditional Christian radio uh, four years ago. I did it for seven or eight years. And you'd be surprised how much gets censored off of traditional Christian radio. There's a lot of stations where if you talk about abuse, they won't play that show. If you talk about addiction, they won't play it. If you talk about drug abuse or pornography, they don't play those shows. Uh, and I just thought, you got to be kidding me. There's marriages being destroyed all over the country. There's families that are being ruined by these things. What do you mean you're not going to talk about it? And uh, they wouldn't talk about it. And so my wife and I just said, we got to. I'd rather talk to a hundred people uncensored than a million people being told what to say. Uh, and so we started three years ago and um, I would say in the last year, we've kind of hit a nerve and our numbers keep growing and growing and growing. And it's because we're just being honest about the things affecting marriage and affecting parenting and trying to take it in a new way. That's a, a, a novel concept, right? Kind of like what Jesus did. He just, he just told the truth in a loving but uncensored way. Yeah. And then he let the people decide, is that, you know, did it apply to them or not? hundred percent, hundred percent. And here's the truth. Everybody wants help. Uh, everybody wants to have a good marriage. Everyone wants to be a good parent. You don't have people that are like, man, I really hope I'm a terrible parent. I hope I'm estranged from my kids. I hope they hate me and go to therapy when they're older. Nobody wants that. You know, when you get married, you don't think, man, I hope I just annoy this person until they finally leave me. Nobody wants those things. But when you give them answers that you claim are going to work and then don't work, it makes people really, really bitter. It makes them angry. And it, and it kind of feels like you've been stolen from or ripped off. And Laura and I talk about the struggles that we've been through, that we go through. We talk about it while we're going through the struggles. And uh, we're finding more and more Christian leaders that are being really honest and vulnerable about their problems while they're going through it. You know, there was these generations of people that talked about marriage and parenting and they never had any problems. They had all the answers. And if you just follow their three steps, you know, A plus B equals C, just follow what we do and you're gonna have a perfect marriage. And that doesn't work. And we don't claim that it works. And we claim to be fallible like everybody else. And apparently that's pretty relatable to audiences. And so we're just gonna keep going with it. It is. And I'm not sure why, you know, some of the major ministries or denominations or preachers who are in pulpits don't get that. Because everybody, if they're being honest and being real, every person, whether they're Christian or not, yeah. but especially, you know, we're trying to reach the evangelical Christian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If they're in a, in a marriage or they're a parent, there's going to be conflict and stress and for sure and yeah. arguments and disagreements. I don't care if they're the pastor or the pastor's wife or the deacon or the Sunday school teacher or the person who sits in the very back row. Everybody yeah, has problems. You know, Nathan, here's the truth. It's especially if it's the pastor, especially if it's the deacon, especially if it's a Sunday school teacher or worship leader, because they're being targeted. They're for sure being targeted. Their marriage is harder because they feel this internal desire to be a role model, uh, for their congregants and for their congregation. They feel like they need to set a good example. And what Laura and I say is, yeah, here's the good example. When you go through struggles, go to counseling and therapy. When you do something that's inappropriate, say you're sorry and apologize. When you mess up, not if you mess up, seek help uh, and get healing for those things. That's the way we're setting our example of saying, listen, we're not perfect. You know, my, my kids, this is the last year was the very first time in my life because we homeschooled. My kids' teachers watch our show. And I was like, that's kind of weird. Like, it's, I didn't know how to feel about it. Like, my parents experienced that their entire career, but I've never experienced it before. And all of a sudden, there were a few people that were like, oh, well, Ryan Dobson says. And I was like, hey, you got to cut that out. Like, I'm a regular parent that struggles to make it every single day. I just happen to know 
really smart, wise, insightful people. And they're transforming my life on a daily basis. And I'm going to introduce all those people to you. You know, so I, I'm not an expert. I'm just a regular parent that's really trying hard to be better every day. Well, and you're also, you're being honest about <laughs> your shortcomings and your failures. You know, I have a, a almost 15 year old daughter. Hmm. And if I want her to be honest and I want her to say she's sorry when she's done something wrong or admit her mistakes, yep. you know who she's learning those things from? Preach it. Preach it. From me and her mama. That's exactly right. Listen, oh. people don't want to do that. We don't want to say we're sorry to our kids. We want to make it seem like we've got all the answers. We've got it all together. The best way, one of the top ways, in fact, the Fuller Youth Institute, Dr. Kara Powell at the Fuller Youth Institute in, Colorado, in uh, California, they did a long, long, in-depth study called Sticky Faith. How to get your faith to stick on the next generation. How to get to stick to your kids. And they found one of the most crucial, vital, impactful ways you can get your faith and your belief system to stick to your kids is by admitting when you're wrong and saying you're sorry. Yeah. Because most of life is failure. It's rare that we get it right. It's rare that we're a big giant success. It's rare when you get the promotion or the raise. Most of life is failing. Most of life is getting it wrong and teaching them that you can fail over and over again and you can pick yourself back up. You can say you're sorry. You can move on is the best thing we can teach our kids. It's really hard. Nobody wants to be wrong. No one wants to have their kids be like, well, you were mean. Or not. You know, here's the truth. When Lincoln was little, I was a fear-based parent. I was really a bad parent. I was so afraid of hurting the Dobson name and making my parents look bad and making you know, their ministry look bad. I parented out of fear. And I wasn't a good parent. I was an angry parent and a, a scared parent. Most of what I do with my son now is just build him up and tell him how great he is. Because he's great. He is. <clears throat> he's going to be way better than me as he gets older. But I was really binary and really black and white when he was young. And so I can't parent him the way I would parent, like I parent my daughter completely differently because she didn't get all that junk. I mean, by the time she came along, I had been through therapy and counseling and I had a breakthrough and a breakdown. And, you know, I had really gotten, come, turned into a different parent. So I parent her totally different than my son because I just got to tell him, I'm so sorry. I was wrong. You know, he'll be like, well, you would, you would punish Lucy for the thing she's, you would have punished me for what she's doing. I'm like, you're right. And it was wrong. And I shouldn't have done it. And I'm so sorry. I just have to apologize for it. And I don't like doing it. But the more I do that, and the more I tell him how great he is, and the more I build him up and tell him, I can't believe I get to be your dad. Oh, my goodness. What an amazing treat to be your dad. The more I do that, the better our relationship is. Like we, we hang out and watch movies on the weekends together. Me and my 12 year old, he's almost 13. And people are like, oh, the tweens, they get so sassy and they don't want to be your friend anymore. Like, I don't know about you, man. Me and my kid watch superhero movies together all the time. Oh, my daughter and I, we go to Dave and Buster's all the time and play video games. Oh, good for you. Awesome. You know, we watch movies, we hang out. We, we, yeah, we, you have your moments where they're, you know, being a, a, an individual. Yes. You totally. know, they're being, uh, always laugh with your dad. You know, I want my daughter to be a strong willed child. After yeah. she leaves the house. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. You know, that's the but, thing, though. What you want is for them to behave when they're out of the house yes. and figure out who they are in the home where they're safe with you, where they can push the line, where they can figure out, where they can ask those questions, where they can be ornery, all those things. You want that in the house. because And, and by the way, when they do that in front of you, and not out of the house, it says, I feel safe in this place. If they act like an angel in the house and they turn around and they've got clothes hidden in their locker at school and they're dressing differently at school and they've, they're putting on different makeup at school and they're listening to different things and saying different things and they're a different person outside of the home, it means they don't feel safe to be who they are in the home. You yeah. want them to be the crazy person in the home and figure out, oh, this is too far. Okay, all right, I got, I got to rein this one a little back in. You know, you want to hear from their, the, from their friend's parents, like, wow, your kid's really polite. You're like, my kid? Wow, okay, awesome. Yeah. And, you know, that, the, and Timothy obviously talks about that, be thou an example. Yeah. A lot of times what has happened in my own life that I can see, and in, in others, but I'll speak specifically about mine, is being a hypocrite. 
Mm-hmm. You know, oh, I'm a Christian and I love the Lord and I have faith and I, I, but then over here, I'm doing these other things. That's and right. As parents, we have to realize that, right? If, if we're doing that, don't be shocked when your kids do it. Yeah. Consistency. It's that consistency. And you know, this is a very, this is, Nathan, you grew up, I mean, you're younger than me, but when I was growing up, if there was something terrible happening on the news, my parents didn't have to tell me. You know, the news was on at six and ten. That was it. It wasn't twenty-four hour news cycle. There wasn't social media pumping this stuff into into my face all day, every day. And so I didn't have to deal with lots of things kids today do deal with. And they can take more than we think. We want to shelter them and protect them, but they can take more than we think. And we've got to be honest about those times too. Like my wife. Uh, went through a really bad bout with cancer uh, just over a year ago and had to have facial reconstructive surgery. And she went through chemo for uh, two years and it was terrible. (laughs) It was, it was just, it was the worst of the, anybody that's been through cancer or something like that, they're like, Oh yeah, we get it. We know what you're talking about. And there were days where I just wanted to die. I just wanted to die. And my son would say, daddy, how are you feeling? And I had to be honest. I'm so yeah. sad. I'm so sad. I just wish mommy didn't have to suffer and go. Th- I wish it was me. I wish I could take the pain from her, but I can't. Yeah. Now, if I tell him I'm fine, then it makes him crazy because he intuitively feels that I'm not fine. And why should I be fine? My wife is suffering every day with chemo and she's suffering with stitches and she's suffering with aftermath of surgery and all those things. Of course, I'm not fine and neither is he. And that's the other part is every now and then during that almost three year stint, my kids would just go bonk, bonk, you know, where they just act completely out of line and crazy. And at first I was like, what are they doing? My goodness. In fact, Someone told me this yesterday. They were on the MAC, which is a public transit in the Portland area, uh, Portland Bay Area. There's a public like train system. And there was a dad on the train, and his kids were freaking out. They were like screaming and running up and down the train, and they had these lollipops, and they were sticking them on people's newspapers. And he finally goes, hey, man. And the guy kind of looked up, st- startled, and, and he goes, yeah. And he goes, dude, you got to do something about your kids. And the dad goes, oh. Oh, oh, I'm I'm so sorry. We just left the hospital. My wife just passed away oh. and I don't know what to do. And I don't know what to do with them and I don't know how to tell them. And and I, you know, now in an instant, the entire train was like, oh, stick the lollipop in my hair, you know, punch me in the like, do what at like it was this immediate turnaround. But we forget that as parents. We forget that when we're going through a hard time or a parent is going through a hard time or when they're being bullied at school or when they get a bad grade, sometimes they don't have the emotional tools to deal with this pressure that's going on. We've got to figure out why are they so out of the ordinary right now? Why are they so not like themselves? And then figure it out and give them a little compassion in that time. You know, it's, there may be something big going on. How real quick, how's your wife doing now? Is she better? Um, no, I would love to say she's better. Um, we had about six months cancer free and, uh, it's back. And so in two weeks, she'll go back on chemo again and then we'll, we'll go from there. So she did another stint of chemo about six months and, um, it got pretty bad. So when it gets really bad, she has, um, skin cancer. She has, uh, squamous cell carcinoma in her mouth. Uh, and her lower lip. And so it's spot chemo. And so when it gets, when she does it for a long time, it creates a really big sore and she's not able to speak or eat well. And um, so it got pretty bad. And so they took her off chemo for a couple months and then we'll go back in to check it out in about two weeks. Well, man, I, I don't, I've not been through that. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I pray that you don't. Uh, as, as well, but I'll be praying that, you know, for you all during this time. Thank you. You know, it's, it is, it, it, it is what it is. It's just one of those things. Like you think this is a crazy thing. Like I talk about this super openly now, you know, up in your head 
the rain falls on the good and the bad. And when you grew up in an evangelical church, you do get that idea that if you are a really good Christian, then, you know, the Lord kind of deflects some of the bad stuff off of you. And then you go through these really long bouts of hard times. You are like, wait a minute, isn't it supposed to be different for us? And the Lord's like, no, you're just supposed to follow me. Yeah. Like, oh, that's right. And so I don't put a bow on it. Cancer stinks. Like it's terrible. Uh, there's nothing good about it. Like, is my faith stronger? Yeah. I just wish I didn't have to experience it. You know, I'd rather have, you know, there's that part of me that would rather have a weaker faith and not have to had not have to have gone through cancer, right? Like, people are like, oh, but this, you know, but you've been you're helping so many people. I'd rather not help you. I'd rather not help you. <laughs> I really would. I'd rather my wife not suffer for it. I don't mind suffering. Like I've been through hard times. I just don't want her to go through it. it. It's one of the most excruciating things is to watch her go through pain and suffering. And there's nothing I can do, but just be there. You know, she gets cranky and we act super inappropriate. That's the thing too. Like you lose friends. You don't realize it. But when you go through your darkest hours, like I act inappropriate completely. Like I, I lash out at times and there is that small intimate group of friends. That's like, yeah, you're ugly. Let's come hang out. Like they want you to be the uglier you get, the more they surround you with their affection and support. And then there's the people that are like, Oh, we thought you'd handle this better. We don't want to hang out with you anymore. And you're like, Oh, that really stinks. And that's how it is. Like, and anybody that goes through really, really dark times has experienced that. And it feels so abandoning. And then you've just got to be like, okay. That's, and I got to say, though, when you figure out who your true friends are, it's like a gift you've never experienced before. Like, I'll just say, my friends Marshall and Lindsay and Zach and Sarah are my all-time ride-or-die best friends. And they are like... It's indescribable the intimacy of friendship that you can have with a person when you've acted inappropriately and they laugh and giggle and want to put their arms around you when you're just like, oh, I don't want to be around you. I don't want to, you know, I want to just, you know, freak out. And they're like, good, freak out with us. Like those real friends, ooh, you've never experienced friendship like that. It's the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. And I, I don't, I've not been through what you've been through. I've had some trials and tribulations in my life, but not to that extent. But you really get to the point at times where you want to say, God, you know, why, or where are you? Or, you know, why is this happening to me? You, you start to question God. Yeah. Um, here's the truth. When, when Laura first got diagnosed with cancer, I was like, we're going to get through this. We've been through hard things before. We're going to power through this. And I'm telling you, man, I got kicked in the teeth. I got I got knocked on my rear like I never experienced before. And I'm in my studio right now, but it used to be our garage. And right there, we've got a little bookcase. And I can remember coming into the garage and weeping because I didn't want to do it in front of my kids and my wife. You know, like I just yeah. could put them through my breakdown and I just lost it. And I just, I thought, I just want to feel the Lord. I just want to feel him. I just want to know that you're with me. And I didn't, I, I honestly, I did not feel it at all. But what I did hear is even when I don't feel him, he's still with me every step of the way. It's just me yeah. that doesn't feel him. He's still got his arms around me right this instant, right this second. He's still collects every tear in his bottle you know like it's just me and if I can push through those times and just say I know the Lord is there and I'm gonna trust him even when I don't feel it well, especially when I don't feel it when you want to doubt and you want to be like where are you he's like here all the time <laughs> I'm never gonna leave you I'll never forsake you and you just keep going on. And then, you know, you get to the times where you get through it and you're like, he was there for us. And he really was every step of the way, whether I felt him or not, he was there. And you see it in hindsight, but this is what we say on Rebel Parenting. There is a light at the end of the tunnel and the tunnel is super dark. 
And it's okay when you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's okay when the darkness is there. You just keep putting one foot in front of the other and trusting that someday the light will come again. Yeah. And and that is something as easy to say, but it's something that's, I mean, it's, it's a faith. It's a, it's a choice. Um, I mean, to go what you, you know, going through and then to stay in it for so long and then to still be in it. Yeah. And then to have that testimony that you just, you know, shared with us, brother. I mean, that speaks volumes about what God can do in someone's life. Because from an earthly standpoint, I mean, you should have thrown in the towel a long time ago and, and been done with it. Just mad at God, upset, you know. Lord, I'm trying to serve you and you got all this going on in my life. For sure. Yeah. Hey, brother, you, as you I, know, don't have it. I don't have that quit gene. Like, yeah. But as you know, there's a lot of people out there who do. And I for a time had where yeah. I was just like, oh, well, you know, if God's not going to do his part, I'm not going to do mine. And it, it was it was the wrong attitude. God was doing his part already. Mm-hmm. I was 100 percent not doing mine. Yeah. And I've been there for sure. You know, it's. It's just, I, I just want people to understand, like, you know, sometimes in, in the Christian world, we're like, you know, just pray and the Lord's going to be there for you. Well, yeah, he'll be there for you. You just may well, not feel wait, it. You got to throw in there, read your Bible and pray. Yep, those, absolutely. Those, are the two, those are the two that go to, you know, pat you on the shoulder. We'll just yeah. get in God's word and pray and everything will be all right. No, get no. In God's word and pray and do the right thing. And someday you'll meet him in eternity and glory. But in this life, you will have trials and tribulations. It will happen. That's just how it is. It will happen. And, and there, there, there might be some trials and tribulations that last our entire lives. Yep. It might not, it might not ever be cured. For sure. For this sure. Earth. You know, we talk about addiction all the time on Revel. And there was a, a guy, Jay Adams. He was the original modern-day skateboarder. He essentially was the transition from you know, the old surf style to the new modern day skateboarding. It was in early seventies. Um, and he struggled with addiction mightily up until the day he died. And he would say, you know, I have friends, Christian Asoy, one of the massive skaters of the eighties, still, still going strong today. You know, he and Tony Hawk were on par with each other back in the day. Christian struggled heavily with addiction and then was, was miraculously cured and has never gone back to it again. And he said, you know, I don't understand why, God won't cure my addiction. Why do I wake up wanting it all the time? Why do I struggle with it like this? And I've met tons of people that struggle with addiction in that way. And it's just the thorn in their side. It's just that thing that they deal with. It doesn't mean God's not there. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you or care about you. It just means that's your thing. It's, it's the sin nature. Yeah. Some sure. people struggle with porn. Some people drug, right. struggle with alcohol or pills. Some people just struggle with you know, watching too much TV, they're addicted sure. to everything else. Yep. TV yep. or or Candy Crush or you know. That's right. Yeah. Anything that takes us away from God. Yep. Is an is an addiction, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's self soothing. You know. And here's the interesting thing too. For most addicts, it's self soothing. For most addicts, it's I've got this pain in my life, either current or past, that I haven't dealt with and I don't know how to deal with, and so I'm either gonna like eat sugar or go to alcohol. I I live in Colorado. uh, So the number of people that sweet, oh my goodness. I've been been out twice to Colorado, to Denver twice in 2019 to speak at real estate conferences. Oh yeah. First time I came out there, I told my wife, as soon as I stepped off the airplane, got out of the airport, I said, it smelled like my college dorm. It does. Yeah. And people laugh at that. It's true. It's honestly true. You walk around the city and you're like, really? Wow. Yeah. It was like nowhere you could walk that didn't smell like weed. Yep, totally. And so it's it's that self-soothing thing. What we talk about on Rebel all the time is find a good therapist or counselor, you know, um, find someone that can help you with that past hurt. Find someone that can help you with that current hurt so that you don't need to self-soothe anymore. And then there's the addict. I was talking with someone last weekend, uh, blew out his elbow um, and had had elbow surgery as a young person. And the doctor gave him uh, 120 Oxycontin and said, don't take too many of these. Uh, well, guess what? Took too many. Yeah. Which is what's going to happen and has struggled with addiction mightily since then. And it's not self, self-soothing. I mean, it is in a way 
first it was for pain and then it was for phantom faint pain and now it's for normalcy and trying not to go through withdrawal symptoms but yeah uh you know finding help for addiction man there are some great great programs out there for people that struggle with addiction whether it's aa um or you know an inpatient program at some place like uh, on site in tennessee or uh you know yeah. uh alternative the med center in Sedona, Arizona, you know, there's some really, really good programs for people that struggle with addiction. Yeah. And you know, and that's that hole that's in our life, right? Yeah. And that's, that's what Jesus, the Holy spirit is supposed to fill. Mm -hmm. But in, in just because we're saved doesn't mean that we're, we're, you know, have this shield up to addiction because if we don't have yeah. the hole filled with our relationship with God shopping, QVC, yes, yes, on Prime, yes. My, There's my a meme going around on Instagram right now. There's a meme, and it says, uh, "My therapist, what do we do when we feel pain?" And it says, "Me, click add to cart." The therapist, <laughs> no, 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 right? But that's it's exactly right. It's ex in fact tomorrow, on Wednesday, uh, the twenty first, we're airing the broadcast of Johnny Baker, uh, president of Celebrate Recovery. Uh, because addiction is such a big deal out there and there's all kinds, but it, and I'm telling you that, that add to cart makes so many people feel so good. It's just like, I feel so bad today. I feel so depressed. I feel so down. I'm going to add to cart. Oh, I feel so much better. Yes. That's such a normal thing. And people feel so ashamed at their Instagram or TikTok addiction or their shopping addiction or their, or alcohol or porn or whatever. So it's, it's such a normal thing when you're self-soothing from something and getting into therapy and getting counseling and finding ways and tools. I, I went to my therapist, I was telling him, and I said, I feel sad all the time. And he was like, wow, okay, why? And I was like, what? Because, you know, yeah. 15 years ago, when my, my mother-in-law passed away, I told my doctor I felt sad and he prescribed me something for it. Well, I went to my therapist, I said, I feel sad all the time. He goes, why? I go, my wife's in cancer and she's going through chemo and it's just terrible watching her suffer. And he goes, ooh, whoa. Yeah, that's a really good reason to be sad. And I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, you should definitely be sad. You want to learn how to be sad? And I was like, no, I want you to fix me. And he's like, oh, well, no, you just, we need to learn how to be sad. That's something that you can, you need to learn how to grieve. You need to learn those things. And it was, it, that's a terrible process, but I am better at everything else in life because I've, I'm learning how to properly go through grief and sadness it's something you never, ever want to experience. Have someone be like, oh, yeah, so you need to learn how to be sad in front of your kids, how to properly be sad in front of your kids, how to be sad in front of your wife, how not to turn your sadness into anger and take it out on your kids and wife. And it's like, ah. I'm like, so what am I supposed to just come here and cry? And he goes, yeah, okay. And I'm like, ah, that's a terrible answer. It's the right answer. It's just not the one you want immediately, right? But, man, yeah. it makes you better. It makes you – you, you find depth of character – when you go through that stuff. <laughs> but that's not what our society today, we shouldn't have sad moments or we shouldn't have grief, right? Right, yeah. We should always be happy, mm -hmm. which is can never be always happy because it's an emotion. It it's, comes and goes. You can be happy and then get in a car wreck and not be happy. Yep. That's the number one problem in America, Nathan. The number one problem. Americans don't want to feel any pain for any reason for any length of time, and we'll do anything to get through it. We'll do anything to numb that pain out. But learning to experience pain and sit with your pain and sit with your suffering, oof, I'm telling you, it's terrible. But when you figure it out, you become... I mean, you become empathetic to people. You, you are a people magnet. You are a better parent. You're a better spouse. You're a better friend. You're a better kid. I mean, it really, it, it, will, it will make you, in, it's like a superpower. It really is. Well, to have compassion, that's about the only way you can have true compassion, right? Is if you've felt what someone else is going through. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Mm. That's, that's something in our society today. We're very... You know, don't let people see you crack. Don't let them see you unhappy. Don't let them see you hurt because, you know, they'll think less of you. You know what? Here's the truth. Some people will. It's because they're going through pain and suffering themselves. But the majority of people really won't. We did a show about three or four months ago called What to Do When Your Spouse is Going Through Depression Because I Struggle with Depression. And we did it 
I don't know why I thought to do this. I told my producer, my wife, because I was really depressed. Like I was off all my schedules, off all my patterns. I was really, really down. And I'm like, we should do a show on this. And they both looked at me like, are you sure? And I'm like, we should totally do a show. We should just do a show where Laura and I talk about what it's like for me to go through really bad depression and what it's like for her in the middle of that. And we got in the middle of that show. And in my brain, it was like, what are you doing? You should talk about this. This is the stupidest thing you've ever done. No one's ever going to listen to you again. And I finally just broke. And I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm having a panic attack right now. Everything in me says I shouldn't talk about this. We got a flood of emails like, no, no, no. Finally, someone was honest about this stuff. Finally, someone was honest about what it's like. You know, people are like, oh, well, you know, you should exercise. Like I talked to someone that was going through real deep clinical depression. And they were like, my friends were telling me I should exercise. He goes, dude, I wake up in the morning and I honestly debate whether to get up and go into the bathroom and go to the bathroom or just to go to the bathroom while I'm laying in bed. He yeah. goes, you think I'm going to go do cardio for a half hour? Bro, these are, the, these are the legit conversations I have in my head in bed. And it's like, that's real true depression. And we, you know, we talk about this. We say, listen, there's nothing wrong with an antidepressant. Nothing at all. As long as you're getting therapy at the same time, because antidepressants don't give you tools to deal with grief and pain and suffering and depression. Antidepressants don't give you those tools. They do help bridge that gap in the meantime where you can go into therapy and go into counseling and learn how to deal with those times in life where it is so hard. And then you can go down and you can wean off of that. Go with the doctor, do the right thing, but don't just do one thing. That's the real American way. Like, oh, I'm just gonna take this pill, I'll feel better. Like, okay, but you can do that the rest of your life? Like, well, are you sure? That, that's a, a good principle and everything is, don't just deal with the symptom, mm. deal with the root problem. Yeah. Deal with the, you know, take the antidepressant or, you know, do whatever you're doing out here. Yeah. Depression or your relationships or whatever it is. But eventually, if you don't work to the root problem, mm -hmm. the symptoms, you're not, you can't ever fully treat the symptoms. Yep. Totally. 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 And, and that's what most Americans want to do or most yeah. people in general. We just want to deal with the symptoms. We yeah. don't want to deal with, you know, we want a better relationship with our wife. Yeah, you can hire <laughs> roses. Yeah, you can do this. You, but until you put her in front of you yeah, and love her the way Christ loves us, mm -hmm. you're not going to have the relationship that you want. The only way to do that is to have a relationship with God. Yeah, and it's worth it. I'm telling you, I mean, this is the thing. I read that book by Simon Sinek called Start With Why. And I figured out our why at Rebel Parenting. One, Marriage and family is the foundation of society. Where the family goes, the way the society goes. With the way the family goes, the way culture goes, the way the country goes. And when your marriage is really firing, when it's running on all cylinders, when you're really, you know, when it just, it's a great thing. It's clicking. When it's clicking, everything else in your life is better. Everything is better. Everything is better when your marriage is good. When you feel safe around your spouse and you guys are intimate and you're doing it all the time and you just like to be around each other and you've got that, and everything is better. Well, the flip side of that coin is true. When your marriage is in, on the rocks, when it's in the dumps, when you're just like, oh, just hearing you breathe makes me mad. When it's that way, everything <clears throat> in your life is worse. Yeah. Everything. Your sleep is worse. Your stress is higher. It's harder to work out. It's harder to lose weight. Harder to work at all. And I'm telling you, the investment in your marriage is worth it. The investment in your faith is worth it. Those struggles, those hard times. My marriage is strong today because of the hard times we've gone through because of the trials and tribulations we've experienced as a couple and come out on the other side. My faith is strong today because of the hard times I've gone through, because I've wrestled with the deep questions. It's yes. not in spite of it. It's not the cut and run. It's when it gets hard, dig in, dig in, find someone that's going to support your marriage. You know, when you've got doubts, when you're like, oh my goodness, I got married at 20 years old. I was a baby then. I'm 55 now it's been 35 years what was i thinking back then maybe you're not the right person for me find someone that's like no way marriage is a choice love is a choice 
you can choose to have a good marriage. You can work on having a good marriage. Same thing with your faith. Same thing with your faith. Don't go to another faith that's going to tear yours down. Find somebody with a rock solid faith that's been around the block, that's been through the hard times, that's got the scars to prove it, and have them help you get back on track. Absolutely. That one word you use there, choice. Would you say everything we've talked about so far today, and probably everything we will talk about, really comes down to that one word, choice? Do you want to do it God's way, or do you want to do it your way? Yeah. Sure. You know, James, James 3 talks about that, the wisdom, mm-hmm. uh, earthly wisdom versus biblical wisdom. You know, can you survive one aspect of your life in, in an in a earthly? Sure. Sure, 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 sure. But if you're not doing it God's way, eventually it's not going to work. You got so it, it, for sure. So it's a choice. Yep. And the circumstances of life are not a choice. Whether you were born an addict or not is not a choice. Whether you go through cancer is not a choice. You know, those types of things. How you handle those things is a choice. It really is. It's a choice. You can choose. And here's the truth. You can't get it right every time. And when you don't, choose to say you're sorry. Choose to apologize. A choice. Yeah. For sure. And, and, and not, and not a, hmm. oh, I, I'm sorry, but if you hadn't have done that, I wouldn't. Oh. Have. Yeah, for sure. No, no, no. We talk about apologies all the time. So here's how not to apologize. You know, when you get, when you don't eat and your blood sugar gets low and you snap at your wife and your kids, you're like, oh, I'm so sorry. Daddy got hangry. You know how I get when I don't eat? Uh Uh-uh. You're an adult. You have a choice to eat or not eat. You chose to not eat. And then you chose to snap. You got to be like, I'm really sorry. And here's the thing. You got to be specific. This is the thing we would, we'd love to do in marriage and parenting. I'm sorry. Why? Why are you sorry? It's like, we don't want to say, well, you know why, you know, why I'm sorry. You know what happened? Yeah, I do. Tell me, why are you sorry? I'm sorry that I snapped you. I'm sorry. I, I spoke down to you. I'm sorry. I talked that way to you. I'm sorry. I did it in front of the kids. I'm sorry. I didn't set a good example. Get specific, say why, and then say, I won't do it again. Or like I used to really, really struggle with anger, really bad, especially early on in marriage, man. I was just angry, angry guy. There were times where I knew I didn't have a handle on it. And so I would apologize and say, I will get help so that I won't continue to be this person the rest of our marriage. Yep. And it took a lot of therapy for that. But if you need to get help, by all means, go get help. Don't just keep saying you're sorry. Because an apology without change is just an admission of guilt. And that never satisfies the other person. It might for the first time or the second right. time yeah. or the third time, but at some point, it's, hollow. it's not it's just yeah. uh you know oh here here he goes again or here mm-hmm. she goes again yep and yep. it doesn't really ch- it actually makes things worse it'd be better not to say it yes yeah it does it makes it worse it's like oh great you're apologizing again oh, okay uh what's going to change this time right you know and, and i grew up like you obviously if people haven't put it together yet your dad is james dobson <laughs> um so you kind of grew up in this a unique bubble. I grew up, my dad was a small little, you know, uh, Baptist preacher in, in Northern Alabama. And you know what it feels like for sure. Well, yeah. And you, you grew in the time we grew up and probably even some today, it's like, don't go to a counseling, don't go to others. You just yeah. need to get right with God. <laughs> no way, man. I know it was that way. Never show any weakness, man. When I am weak, then I am strong. When I know how weak I am, then I can find strength. No, go get, go get help. If you, there's the truth too. any, cause guys hate going to counseling. It's mostly guys. Women are like, I'm going to have someone listen to me and pay 100% attention to me the whole time. Are you kidding me? That's the greatest feeling in the world. It really, here's the truth. Men and anybody in ministry, it's really hard to do because you're used to giving. You're used to giving back to the person like you're telling them all your problems. And then you're like, I need you to tell me your thing. I need, I need to give back to you right now. If any guy listening, if you believe in oil changes in your car, then you believe in therapy and counseling. It's preventative maintenance. You don't wait till you're, I've, I used to have a, uh, a Ford expedition. Oh, it was so pretty. It was black. It was an Eddie Bauer edition it had leather interior and that super sweet stereo. Ooh, it was so nice. <laughs> And uh, right now it's on blocks at my friend's ranch in Black Forest uh, because I cracked the engine head because I didn't put oil in it in time. And uh, it's too late. 
it will never run again. You won't fix that engine again. It's, it's a scrap. Like that engine is Done. a paperweight. The yep. car itself, is it salvageable? I guess you want to go get a new engine and swap engines, but you're swapping an engine. The engine is broken. It was too late. You get oil changes on a regular basis. So that does it. You don't wait till the engine cracks to put oil in it. Yep. You do it ahead of time. Same thing with therapy. Don't wait till it's too late. Doug Fields, uh, great, great guy. He was on the broadcast and I said, what's he's a marriage and family counselor, uh, written a ton of great books. He's just such a, oh, he's a good guy. And I said, what's the hardest part of your job? And he goes, oh, it's easy. By the time most people seek counseling or coaching, it's too late. Mm. And I know yeah. it when they come in. It's they waited too long. Don't wait till it's too late. Don't wait till it's too long. Just be like, you know what? I don't like this about me. I don't, I'm tired of fighting over the same thing over. We fight over this all the time. We keep fighting over this. We fight over the same thing over and over again. Go get a third party. My wife and I do coaching. Uh, we coach couples. Uh, and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But man, those that really try and really work at it. They have a great marriage. They really work on their marriage. And you can't believe it. A year down the road, you're like, whoa, we're really doing well now. Like, yeah, that's right. You got a third party in there to be honest with you and safe. You need a third party that's safe. You know, Laura and I go to counseling separately and together. And we deal with really hard, hard stuff, but it's safe. I'm safe to be myself in there. I don't get made fun of. I don't, you know, I don't, I, it's a safe environment. So wait, your your counselor doesn't go to church and tell everybody what you told uh, them, like, like most Christians. Oh, goodness. Or as a prayer request, hey, let's pray for Brother Ryan because no he- No way. We call those closed mouth friends. Closed mouth friends. You really need that. It, by the way, here's how you can tell. If your friend is talking about your other friend's problem, then they're talking about yours as well. If they're not mentioning, if you're like, oh, yeah, I think so-and-so is going through a hard time. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, they talk to you all the time, right? Yes, they do. Well, what are they going through? Well, you know, that's private. Let, let, let's pray. Let's pray for them. Yeah. You know? If you'd like to pray for them, that's awesome. But, you know, yep. what they talk to me about is private. Like, ooh, I want that kind of person in my life. You know, and you can go to the counseling. You can go to the the, the doctor side. But yeah. I think there's also strength in, in getting a brother uh, in Christ or a sister in Christ. Same, you know, gender. I've got a couple of guys in my life. We're just accountability partners. We're mm -hmm. hey, I'm looking at this business deal. Um, I think I might be on the line, but what do you think? Yeah. Uh, am I making the right choice? Am I, mm -hmm. or Hey, what do you, you know, just kind of spitballing brainstorming back and forth. And sometimes it's a one text. Sometimes it's a five minute phone call. Right. Right. Those, right. those are good to have too. people that are just, you know, daily support. Totally. Totally. It's also good to have people in your life that will tell you the hard truth. You know, I did a, I did a, I do Monday morning quick take. So I do these Monday morning little, little, they're like 15, 20 minute programs. They're short. Um, and I was at the gym. Oh, this is like a month ago and I do CrossFit. So you always feel like you're dead when you're done. And I finished a workout and I'm literally on my hands and knees on the ground. I'm like staring at the ground trying to catch my breath. I live at 6,800 feet. So the air's already thin. And then you add CrossFit. It's terrible. And I see my coach's feet come and stand next to me and he sits down and he's sitting next to me and I'm not even looking up yet. And he goes, Hey, uh, can I talk to you? And I go, yeah, sure. And he goes, can I be honest with you? And I go, okay. And he goes, are you sure? And I go, yeah. So he asked me twice <clears throat> and he goes, here's the good. And then he listed like seven very specific things that I'm doing well. He goes, you're really coachable. You listen really well. I never worry about you getting hurt because you're really listening to me. And your intensity is crazy. You're super intense. You're working out really hard. And I mean, it was so complimentary. I was like, wow, I fe it felt so good. And he goes, um, and something has to be off with your nutrition. And I started laughing. And he goes, why is that funny? And I'm like, oh man, I eat sugar. And he goes, what do you mean? And because he said, you shouldn't look the way you look working out as hard as you are. You should be shredded. You should be like freaking people out. You're so ripped. And I go, oh, Eric, I eat sugar. I, I struggle. I struggle with addiction, addiction tendencies. I don't take drugs. I don't drink. I haven't had a drink in nine years, but I eat sugar when I feel bad. And he goes, what are you talking about? I'm like, I eat candy and I drink soda. I'm 49 years old. And he was like, but Ryan, it's so bad for you. And I, I couldn't help it. I was rolling. I laughed so hard. And 
because I love this guy. He's the greatest coach. He's so awesome. And he gave me a bunch of really positive things. And he gave me a hard truth. And the truth is I need, I haven't, I haven't eaten candy in two weeks. Um, I still drink soda. I've now mixing half uh, soda water and half uh, like Sprite. So I'm cutting it down, but I needed to hear that hard truth. I really did. I needed to hear, Hey man, you, at this age, you can't really fool around with this kind of thing. You well, know? I, I always laugh with people. I say my six pack is nicely covered with my Hershey chocolate. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So I'm in that same boat with you. Sugar, sugar is my, uh, it's my last thing, right? It's my last, I get it. I know I struggle. What's, here's what's really unique about your story. And I think most people are, are here. You already knew what your problem was, <laughs> oh, Yeah. right? <laughs> totally. You, you just needed someone else to, to, to confirm to you yeah, that they knew what your problem was. And that's where counseling or another brother or sister in Christ can yeah. really help us is that, you know, I already know pretty much everything I should be doing or how I should be doing it. Yeah. But when I don't, it's always good for someone to say, hey, you know, your, your 5% that you're missing here, or the reason you're not getting to your end goal or staying there is because you're not you know, you're eating sugar or you're not spending quality time with your wife or you're not yeah. spending quality time with your kids. Yeah. You're spending money on them and you're doing all that you send them to a great school and they got a nice car to drive, but are you spending quality time with them? Yep. 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 And it's normal. It's normally the little things. It's, it's the big things we work out. It's the sure. little things that normally get us. Yep. That's true. And that's what I tell people too. You got to listen to how he did that. And those are the people that you want in your life. He asked permission twice and I gave him permission to give me hard truth. And then he gave me a really great compliment. In fact, like six or seven really good compliments. And then he gave me one thing to work on. One thing, not like this giant list of everything I'm doing wrong. One thing. And then said, if there's anything I can do to help, you let me know. Any way I can support you and help you, you let me know. And I was like, dude, I love this guy. I love this guy. It's exactly what you want. You know? And if you need to give somebody hard truth, that's the way to do it. Ask permission. They might say no. They might be like, you know what, man? I'm struggling right now. I just need support. All right, cool. Then I'm there for you. Then I'm there for you. Awesome. What do you need? Yep. And then when they're ready to talk. Yeah. They talk. Yep. And they know you're there for them, right? Hey. I love you. I care about you. I want the best for you. If you want to talk, I'm here. If not, no big deal. Still love you. Still care about you. Still want the best for you. I'm going to be here with you, right? So, Ryan, as we kind of wrap up today, um, if someone is listening and they're struggling with something, yeah. addictions or life choices or whatever, what's, what's a couple of things advice-wise you would give to them as either resources or things they could do? What would you say to them? Yeah. Oh, gosh. So if you're struggling with addiction, there are some great things out there. Johnny Baker's book, I'm totally going to draw a blank on what it's called. I'm so, I apologize. But the program's tomorrow. It's on Rebel Parenting. He's got a good book. Um, uh, Neil T. Anderson has an amazing book called The Bondage Breaker, and it is unbelievable. Is it the, ro is it the road to freedom? Yes, I think it is. That sounds right. That's at least what Amazon says. Yeah. Yes, the road to fr the road to freedom, healing from your hurts, hangups, and havocs. Yeah, uh, that's Johnny Baker. Baker. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Um, the bondage breaker is super powerful, really, really powerful. Those are big ones. If you've got a spouse that struggles with addiction, um, which is it's so common, and the spouse is like freaking out, they don't know what to do. Um, if it's porn or infidelity, Cindy Beal's book, uh, "Rebuilding a Marriage Better Than New." is super good or lisa turkhurst Woo, lisa turkhurst oh my goodness she's a hero she's got a book called it's not supposed to be this way um she was going through cancer and in the middle of it her husband fell off the wagon and cheated on her and they came public with it in the middle of it and i just think she is awesome for being vulnerable and being honest and if you know you can eat my we have one part-time employee we have a, a producer so if people email me um Here's what they can do. If you text the word rebel to the phone number 444-999, that puts you on our email list. You give your email and then you get on our email list. That email that you get from us, it comes from help at rebelparenting.org. That just goes to me. 
you know, people email me on Facebook and they email me privately all the time. If I can help, I do. You know, my wife and I do private coaching. Um, it's not cheap, um, but you know, we do. A, we've got full time jobs, and so we can't afford to to do it. You know, for we can't afford to do it for free for sure. Got You got to feed those kids, man. Yeah, we do. Um, but you know, I had two people email me last week. A woman emailed me with her husband that struggles with addiction, and I sent her a bunch of resources. Uh, and then I I had someone reach out. And one of their kids is struggling because her husband, his daddy is passing away and he is freaking out. And I didn't have any resources. I didn't know what to do. And we had uh, Dr. Mark Mayfield on the broadcast recently. And I reached out to him and he gave me some great resources for her. And so I just emailed her back with those. Um, That's one thing that Laura and I also talk about when people email us. I can't fix you. I can't do the work for you. You know, sometimes we get emails from people that want us to do the work for them. I can't do the work for you, but the investment is worth it. And so if you put the time in and you put the investment in, I promise you it'll be worth it. I promise it'll be worth it. And, you know, you can find a good counselor. The American Association of Christian Counseling, AACC. There's a link on our website, rebelparenting.org, to find a counselor in your area. And if you email us and ask for our resources for counseling, there's a number of resources uh, nationwide to find counselors. We we, uh, send that out all the time. And and just for, I know what you believe on this, but just so other, I mean, seeking wisdom and counsel from others is very biblical. Oh, yeah. And we always say, find a Christian counselor. Find yeah. somebody that has your belief system at heart, right? Like that's that should be a given, but I, I really do need to say that. Find a Christian counselor that believes what you believe. Uh, I mean, Dan Allender, when you want to deal with like abuse and past trauma, ooh, he is like, ooh, I went through his, uh, he has a podcast series on spiritual abuse. It will rock your world. It will rock your world. But so many people have experienced it. So many people have experienced it. So you can find those types of podcasts. He's a, he is just a genius. Woo. Well, the, you said that earlier, you can't do the work for someone. I mean, it really comes back to that word choice. Yeah. You, yeah do you choose that you want to get better mm-hmm. or do you, you know, being from, from the Alabama or, or do you just want to waller? which is, you know, what a pig does in mud. You just want to waller and have other people feel sorry for you. Totally. Yep. Yep. And if you just want people to feel sorry for you, you can't help them. I can't. I mean, nobody can help them. But if you want to choose, there's great resources out there. Podcasts. A lot lot of this stuff is free too. YouTube videos. Whoa. I'm telling you. Yes. A thousand times. Yes. YouTube and podcasts have changed my life. Changed my life. The other thing though, this is the thing too. If you want help and you want someone to feel like, not feel sorry for you, but empathize with you, it's different than just feeling sorry for you. Empathize with you. A good therapist does that. Yes. Like this is the craziest thing. My therapist, Sam, I should, probably shouldn't, uh, it doesn't matter. He's the best. I don't care. Like he can't tell anybody that he's my therapist, but I can tell everybody that he's my therapist. Yep. The first couple of times I saw him, he did this thing that just threw me off so much. I would talk, and then he, when I would stop, he would he would look up in the air, and he would go. And finally, I go, what are you doing? And he goes, well, when you're talking, I'm listening to you, and so then I have to think about what I want to say next. And it was like, what? That's correct. Most people are thinking about what they want to say while you're talking. They're not really listening to you. They're listening partly to you, but mostly what they're doing is thinking what they want to say next. To have someone that literally pays complete attention to you and then thinks about it and then speaks, whoa, that will blow your mind. It will oh, yeah. Blow your mind. Yeah, it, it absolutely. And, you know, that in our marriage and our relationships would be a really good tool to take, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I tell you what, let me give one thing to husbands. Because men are problem solvers by nature. We're problem solvers. And when our wives come to us with problems, we want to solve them because that's what we want. We want our problems solved. You go to therapy, solve my problem, help me in this thing. You go to a friend, hey, I got this issue, I got a problem. What you're looking for is advice, solving problems. Oftentimes, women just want to be heard and listened to. And so early on in my marriage, I had to learn to say this. My wife would come to me with a problem, and I would say, uh, solve or listen. And she would go, what? And I go, you want me to solve this or listen to you? I'm telling you over nine times out of 10, 19 times out of 20 or 29 times out of 30, she would say, just listen, listen, 
And in the beginning, it was really hard because I had such good advice to fix that problem. But then over time, it takes the pressure off. I don't have to solve your problem. I don't have to have a good advice. I just have to sit here and listen to you. And then she talks for a while and I go, awesome. And then I don't have to, I don't have to say anything. Okay. Like, okay, great. And she feels listened to and understood and heard. And then she feels better. So with husbands, solve or listen, solve or listen. And because most, like after a while, you can figure out, oh, you just want me to listen. Awesome. I'm just going to sit here and listen to you. Great. Yeah, that's, that, worry about that's awesome advice, man. Because it's true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's spot on. Um, but it's really hard to do that when your nature is a solver. Totally. I, remember, I promise you, I was like 15, 16 years old and a girl broke up with me or I broke up with her and I was heartbroken and I didn't know what to do about it. And my dad was on a trip and I told my mom and then she told me a story about a breakup she had and how sad she was too. I remember thinking, why are you telling me this? I feel worse now. I feel, just tell me what to do. Fix. And I was like, can I call dad? And she was like, okay. It was like this epiphany <laughs> moment. She was relating to me. She was relating with me. She was empathizing with me. I did not want that. I wanted do these five things. You're going to feel better. Like, okay, I'll do those five things. Yeah, go, go date hilarious. another, go date another girl. <laughs> that was probably your dad's advice. Or, you know. uh, do you know what else? My mom is the greatest. She's the best. She realized she missed me. She realized in that moment, she missed me completely. And in her desire to help me out, she called my friend, Mark Roseboro. I, he, he wouldn't care that I use his name at all. We're still friends on Facebook, 30 years on. She called my friend, Mark, and was like, Ryan's really sad. Will you go to the mall with him? I'm going to give him money for clothes. And she sent me to the mall with my friend Mark to pick out clothes. I remember he was like, I don't know why we're here for clothes. I was like, I don't either. But she gave me money. I think we used it for food or something else. But I realized she was trying to meet my needs. And it was so cute. And it was, I, I loved her more for it. So, yeah, yeah. I have, so, to, I have to share my uh, quick, uh, I've got a lot of stories with, with your mom and dad from the CNPs. And then yeah, for sure. That. This meant about, I've been married for 16 years this December. Nice. So probably about 12 years ago at NRB in Nashville. And your mom and dad was walking down the big corridor there with uh, Stu and Nancy Epperson. Oh, yeah. And uh, my wife, Jordan, and I are walking up. And we stop there for a minute. And we're talking. And your mom has laryngitis. <laughs> and your dad says, you know, she can't talk right now. And I, I am a joker. I love to joke around. I, you know, very smart mouth in a sense and before i say my wife she's look, turning to look at me like the no type <laughs> and i said well hey miss dobson i said you know there won't be women in heaven and she draws back and your dad and the eppersons look at me and i said well revelation says there'll be 30 minutes of silence oh and your dad and and Stu, big Stu started kind of laughing yeah until the women looked at each other and i was like Oh, my wife, she gave it to me. She's like, oh, yeah. you, you can't do jokes like, but <laughs> the last time I saw your dad four or five years ago, he brought that up and he was like, Hey, I remember that joke about oh, revelation. That's awesome. That's it, awesome. It was, um, they both laughed about that too. That's oh, yeah. where you're like, uh Oh, did I cross a line? And then everybody starts laughing. You're like, okay, I can laugh now. Yeah, I can laugh now. Hey, you know, as Christians, it's, it, it, you know, that's, that's the uh, a point of it's okay to have fun. Oh yeah. It's okay totally. to, to, you know, time and place. Yeah. Um, but hey, man, I really appreciate you, you, you know, sharing and, and being real because that's, that's what we as Christians, we need to do, right? For sure. We don't need to, to, to do our shirt up and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian and everything's good in my life. And, um, you know, everything's going grand and great. When I hear yep. people say that, I'm like, you know, I want to ask them. And sometimes I do, if I know them well enough, well, what are you doing for God? Because if everything is smooth sailing and nothing's going wrong and well, most likely Satan's got you right where he wants you. Yep. 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 Definitely. Um, and then, you know, in our lives, we have kind of the two trials and tribulations. In my opinion, we have Job, mm -hmm. what, your wife's cancer. No, we didn't, she didn't have a choice in that. We have Jonah, the choice we make. For sure. That leads to the trials and tribulations that we could have avoided had we not been there. Yep. And I find in my life, most of my trials and tribulations are unfortunately Jonah. 
Oh yeah. I think that's the way with all of us. I think, and that's the hardest thing to deal with. It really, it's the hardest thing to deal with. That's that blind spot thing. Uh, you know, um, but it's good to deal with it. It's good to figure out where you, where you have those blind spots, where you've got those things. You're like, man, I keep doing this. I wonder why. And talking to a closed mouth friend or your spouse, I mean, like, you know, if you see me doing this again, can you tell me, you know? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and then, don't, don't get mad at them when they do tell you. No, 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 no. If you give someone no. permission, you gotta, you gotta roll with it. Right. You gotta, you gotta take it. Yeah. So, hey, man, I, I know you, you mentioned uh, rebelparenting.org earlier. So is yeah. that, um, is your show, can I, they download here and there? How can they connect? Uh, oh yeah. We're on iTunes and Spotify. We're all over the streaming services, rebel parenting. Uh, in fact, you can tell because Laura's got pink hair in our rebel parenting photo, she dyes it pink for uh, cancer awareness Monday every year. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Um, the podcast. And then if people text the word rebel to four, 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 nine, 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 it puts them on the mailing list. Um, we're not, um, we're a sponsor based program. Um, so, uh, we've got sponsors that are, that are trying to help pay our bills. We're still a 501c3. We're still tax deductible. Uh, but we're not one of those, organizations that just emails you asking over and over and over again um we're really trying to give good help whenever we do send an email out yeah so you're trying to really help people in their daily lives with yep. free you know yep. good biblical based a bible based christ centered resources content resources 100 yep. percent. yeah we did podcasts awesome. podcast four times a week it's all marriage, all parenting all the time. If you, if you want to get a little help in your marriage and your parenting, I'm telling you, our guests are amazing. They really are. I am constantly blown away at just the gold they pass along. I mean, the gold. I've had my life totally transformed because of my podcast, and I am just thrilled to pass it on to other people. That's awesome, brother. That's awesome. Was there anything else you want to share this is great i appreciate it what a fun podcast thanks for having me on yeah absolutely Thank, thanks for coming on and i i look forward to um you know having you on again in the future and i hope people will go to your site and to your podcast and you know really start taking this you know versus you know the knowledge we know what to do but actually start applying it for sure yeah definitely and you can do it one step at a time right mm -hmm. just Take little baby steps. Baby steps add up over time. Do the little things and it will add up over time. It'll make your life better. Awesome. That's good, solid advice. Ryan, again, thanks so much for joining us. And I look forward to having you on the show again. Thanks, Nathan. Anytime.